Well, for those of you who are maybe listening and wondering why Paul doesn't sound like Paul tonight, <laughs> called Paul is on vacation or leaving on vacation or somewhere. Appreciate the opportunity. Oh, always, always joy trying to teach a little bit. Uh, here's the I really like passwords. Uh, I appreciate Paul and Paul's. Paul has knowledge of the scriptures. There's always some thought-provoking questions. Steve's not here tonight, so I'll pick on. I think it was last week. Steve said, "Is it all right to lie?" Certain occasions. I thought, now, how Paul going to handle this? Because we were talking about David and, and how David, let's just say he kind of made facts about certain things. I had a, I, I told you about my friend who was an ex hells angel who's probably one of the best friends I ever had. He told me one time, he said, J.D., I will never lie to you. Now, I'll tell you the truth a lot of different ways, but I'll never lie to you. And, and it, it's amazing sometimes how things work. I was listening to the radio this week and thinking about what I was going to talk on tonight and thinking about what Steve had asked and how Paul answered his question. It was all right to tell a lie sometimes, to keep from having harm to some to others or maybe even harm to yourself. And I was listening to this story that a guy was telling about a friend of his, an older man who had, uh, he was on trial. And he'd been on, he was on trial for insurance, attempted insurance fraud. An older gentleman, he, the uh, insurance company's attorney got up and said, now, sir, let me get this straight. When you were interviewed at the scene of the accident, you said there was nothing wrong with you. But now, two weeks later, you're claiming to have a broken leg. He said, that's right. He said, would, would you tell the jury why you lied at first about having a broken leg? He said, yes, I'll be happy to. He said, it was like this that morning. I, I'm going to market. And I loaded up a hog in the back of my truck. And I was going to the feed to, to the livestock sale and a big tractor trailer that was hauling a load of cows. Sideswiped me, ran me off in the ditch, turned me over, and the trailer turned over, and all those cows just, he said, there was cows everywhere, on top of me, beside me, he said, they were just everywhere. He said, about that time, a, a, a sheriff did, he pulled up, and the truck driver, he got out without a scratch. The policeman asked him, said, what's wrong with that cow right over there? He said, well, that cow's got a broke leg, and he shot him. He said, there's another cow over there. He said, what's wrong with that cow? He said, well, he's got a broke leg, so he shot him too. So he hollered down at me and he said, oh man, what's wrong with you? He said, not a thing in the world. <laughs> oh, my God. What do you do when the answer's no? What about that? What do you do when he really got that one right at first? <laughs> Sometimes I, I tell stories like that, and you have to wait till you get home before you get them. So we, we talk sometimes, and Paul is on a series of lessons on Sunday morning about difficult scriptures. And I was thinking about one, and it, it's found over in the book of John. And we, we, we're going to look at two scriptures. That's one from one of my favorite characters in the Old Testament. That John chapter 15 is where we'll be. And, and this this is a real interesting time in the life of Christ. So all the gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, three synoptic gospels in John, each give their view uh, of the life of Christ. If you look at John's 
account of the gospel. It's different from the other three in that John writes in a, a different approach to the life of Christ. Look at the book of John. There's, I think there's 21 chapters covering 33 years of his life. If you look starting in chapter 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, and 18, out of those 21 chapters, six chapters deals with one evening in the life of Christ. It's that night on which he was betrayed. Uh, he starts he starts account because to John, that's where the true message of the life of Christ is found. Is in that last few hours with his disciples. He makes a statement. Right? We all know John 14, one of my favorite passages. That night. He sees his disciples. He sees this troubled look on their face. Let not your heart be troubled. You know that one. But he, he goes over into chapter 15. And cha chapter 15 is it's a chapter that deals with relationship. The first part of it deals with a believer's relationship. Christ. The middle part of it talks about our relationship to one another. Love one another as I have loved you. The last part of it deals with the believer's relationship to the world. But it's in this first part where he talks to those 11 men around that table in verse 7, and he, he says this, If you abide in me, and my words abide in you, you will ask what you desire, and it shall be done for you. Did you catch that? Ask what you desire. Dwell in me. My word dwells in you. Whatever you ask, I will grant to you. That sounds like if I pray fervently and ardently, and, 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 and I believe and I trust in God, no matter what I ask, I'll receive that. Uh, I don't know about y'all, but there's a lot of times in my life that I didn't get what I prayed for. I think about Garth Brooks. In his song, he said one time, one of God's greatest gifts is what? Unanswered prayers. And I think I, I'm glad sometimes God, God doesn't answer my prayers. But what do you do when, when you, do we believe verse 7? Well, yeah, I believe it because, like the man said, I, God said that I believe it, that settles it. Then why do I sometimes see people that I, I know have a closeness to God, but I see their prayers go unanswered? I want to take you to another verse. I want you to flip back to Deuteronomy. We're going to take one from the New Testament. I want you to keep that thought in mind. Deuteronomy chapter 3. I think I'm right on that. Let me make sure before I tell you wrong. Yes, Deuteronomy chapter 3. We'll just have it just a minute. So many times we, we see where people pray. They ask God for certain things. And the answer comes back. Sometimes they don't get an answer. You know, Paul told the church, Paul ran he said, I plead with the Lord three times, three times, that the thorn might be removed. The Lord said, my grace is sufficient. My grace will sustain you. You know, Jesus himself, on that same night that we're talking about in John chapter 15, pardon, as he prayed to the Father, Father, if there's any way, let this cup pass from me. Nevertheless, not my will, but your will be done. What does it mean when we when we get no answer from God? 
Take you over to Deuteronomy chapter three. Story from the life of Moses. Moses is one of my favorite characters. I guess because I like Charles and Testament. And he was in the Ten Commandments. And I remember him on the talking to the burning bush. I remember him parting the, the Red Sea. Uh, great movie. I think that was the first movie that my family went to. Do any of you remember the Percy Warner Theater, drive in theater? Yes, I saw the Ten Commandments. At the Percy Warner Drive in Theater. Still remember. I've been asked to preach tonight too, so I'll give you insight on what's going to happen Sunday night. I don't know. I think I know what's happening Sunday morning. Jay's preaching. And he gave me he gave me the song service, so I'm doing so I'm doing Jay's song service. I selected most of them anyway, Jay. That's that one I have no idea what it is. Ain't seen that. I, I told you the story about Roger Foster one day. He was an elder at West Nashville Heights when I was leaving. It was kind of like this. We had chairs up on the pulpit, and two chairs on each side, and one man would get up and do his part, and another man would get up and he'd go back and sit down in his place. I got up to lead singing right before when. We did everything scriptural. We had three songs, reading, prayer, one more song before the ser sermon. Everybody had to stand up on that song. That's scriptural. I walk up to the podium, Roger Foster is sitting over here, and I, I announced a song, 350. And out of the corner, this voice comes and says, sing 349. I don't know that song. That's okay, sing it anyway. <laughs> and we did. Fortunate, we had people like Teresa and Michelle who, if you got it started, they could take it. So, so sometimes we want certain things. And, and we we want them so badly we can somebody said you can almost taste it. Moses and Sunday Sunday night we're going to talk about I like to talk about the history behind songs and the message that, that's contained in songs because I think sometimes in our song service we just kind of get we gloss over what the message is. And song Sunday night will come from a time in the life of Moses when God said no to him. But this is another time. Look at Deuteronomy, if you go back and look. Actually, as Paul has pointed out, it actually means a second proclamation of the law. Moses' final address to the people. He tells them, reminds them of the things that happened as they left Egypt. How God brought him out of Egypt. He tells him, it reminds him of the 40 years they wandered in the wilderness because of their difficulty. Chapter 3, starting in about verse 23. Moses reminds the people of a conversation he had with God. You know, Moses. The reason I get fascinated by Moses because Moses is on a first name basis with God. You remember Aaron and uh, Miriam one time rebelled against Moses. They said, you, you take too much charge of everything. He said, you know, we, we're just as important as you are. And God said, you need to understand. I talk to Moses face to face like I'm talking to a friend. That's the relationship that God has with Moses. Moses is recounting conversation 
here in chapter 3 that he had with God. And I don't think it's a prayer. I think it's more of a direct question to God. He's telling the Israelites about everything that's happened to them in his life, starting in verse 23. Then I pleaded with the Lord at that thing, saying, O oh Lord, you have begun to show your servant your greatness and your mighty hand. For what God is there in heaven and on earth who can do anything like your works and your mighty deeds? I pray, let me cross over and see the good land beyond the Jordan those pleasant mountains in Lebanon. That's his request, God. Direct request. God, for 40 years, I have put up with this rebellious people. I've led them through the wilderness. I've listened to them gripe and complain about everything. Let me cross over and see good land. Watch the Lord's reply. But the Lord was angry with me on your account and would not listen to me. So the Lord said to me, enough of that. Speak no more of this matter. I was 14 years old. And I met... Y'all don't know Kenny Park. I was 14. I had a Western Auto. Kenny Clark was in my class at West Junior, West National Junior High School. And I was a friend. A Honda. 25 super sport motor and spanking new and he parked it next to my western auto English and as Jerry Power would say Kenny flung the craven on me I went home and talked to Mom Buster. That's what I want. And, and I mean, that that's probably the first thing I had ever really, well, the true word is covet, I think is what they call that. I, I wanted one like that because number one, you could go uphill without heading. That was a great thing, and it went fast. I know, because he let me ride, and it was something else. And my mother, I, I, she said, no. I didn't understand that. Is it because you don't love me? Is it because I've done something wrong? And I just kept after her. Until those words came out, wait till your dad gets home. And this was a good thing this time. Usually those words brought fear. You should talk to your dad when he gets home. So he got home. We didn't have a real long conversation about that. He said, what did your mother say? I said, she said no. Well, go see if you can change your mind. Do any of you know a lady by the name of Penny? Warby McGill. Does that name ring a bell to anybody? Anybody see the movie? Where art thou? Do you remember the wife? And uh, where art thou? Penny, Holly Hunter played Penny Warby McGill. And she had a saying that I think my soul is my mother. She said, I have said my piece and counted the three. 
And what that meant was the discussion was closed. This is the answer that God gives to Moses. Moses, the discussion is over. Do you listen to those words? To me. Why would God tell Moses no? Now we know why. You go back in his life, he got flustered at the people. I told him to speak to the rock. He took his rod, smoked the rock. Do I have to bring forth water for you, vipers? And he disobeyed what I told him. But we know God is a just God and a merciful God and a forgiving God. So if that's the case, why would God tell Moses no? I think sometimes we can learn a valuable lesson in what God, why God told Moses no. When sometimes we get no answers to our prayers. Number one, I think it's it. God has a better perspective. I don't know, but a long time ago, I wore out. Rabbit, hair wall. I told my wife one time, she said something about it. I said, I can bend spoons. I can't read minds. I don't know what's going to happen, Mom, but God does. God knows what's in store for Moses. Moses, you have led these people 40 years. I know what lies ahead. There's seven years of battle facing Joshua and the people. These people that you have led for 40 years are going to keep on complaining. There's going to be rebellion in the camp. You're going to see, you're going to see great things, yes, but you're, you're going to see more in trouble. Moses, take my word for it. I'm doing you a favor. You know, I, I believe my mother and I think my dad told me thing when I asked about the Mosai. Son, I'm giving you a favor by not letting you have a motorcycle. Looking back on it, he did. He had seen a whole lot more people injured and killed on a motorcycle than I had. He had a whole lot better perspective. And so his no was not one from a lack of concern or lack of consideration for me or even a lack of love for me. I think about that a lot, especially right about this time, because tomorrow will be 18 years since my dad died. And so, you know, I thought about him as I was thinking about this, and there were so many times he, 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 he would tell me no. I wouldn't understand it at the time, but looking back on it now, it's because he knew what lay ahead. I dropped out of college. My mother was torn up. I came home on a Wednesday in the middle of the week. And she said, what are you doing home? I said, I've dropped out of college. I'm not going back. Oh, I'm oh, my dad at work. Your son, your son, you know it's bad when, when, you know, it's no longer him. It's your son has dropped out of college. Okay, I'll talk to him right now. He came home. He said, well, your mom tells me you dropped out of college. I said, yes, I, I can't take it anymore. But I want you to know where. Okay, play that. It's a, you went farther than anybody in the family ever thought. What do you plan on doing? I said, I don't know anything other than work on air conditioning and fit pot pieces. That's great. Six o'clock in the morning, truck leave, go to work with me. For the next three months, he could be arrested for slavery. I did stuff that they would not ask. Right? <laughs> 
came to him and said, you know, I think I'm going back to college. I was trying to college the wood. He had a whole lot better perspective. God tells Moses, Moses, you are not going over into the land. Why? I know what lies ahead. You know, we sing this song sometimes. I don't know about tomorrow. But I know who holds my I know who holds tomorrow. And I know who holds my God has a better perspective. God has so he, I like the statement that he makes that Jeremiah recounts in Jeremiah the 29th chapter in the 11th verse. He said, For the Lord said, I, I know the plan I have for you. I'll give you hope. To give you hope. Moses said, I've got other things for you. I also have other things. For the people you've trained. You, you, you've led these people for 40 years. You put up with them for 40 years. You've done a great job. Now, I've got another plan for you. You know, after Moses died, when will we see him next? You remember? Mount of Transfiguration. Jesus is there along with two. Moses and Elijah. Moses will be a representation of the old law. Elijah, when it's into oh, that, that transition between the old law and Moses and the new law and Jesus Christ. Prophets tell about the one who's coming. Here, well, here with Moses and the old law. Here's Christ in the new law. It's all a plan. That's a very bachelor. Remember being a great preacher. He had a Bible department Christian for years. His autobiography was entitled this. Every life a plan God. God has a better plan. God knows his plan. I may try to alter his plan. I, I may I may ask for something that goes totally opposed to how he has plan. Now, does that mean a predestined? No, but God knows where my moral choices will take me. God has a better perspective. God has a better plan for Moses. God has a better purpose for Moses. Let's go back to Deuteronomy. Take you down to verse, I think this is verse 28. I told you before, I, I left my Bible out in the rain one night and the print shrunk on it. And these little numbers beside the verses, they get really small now. I, I've got it. I've got it. I don't know if this is vanity or not, but I have a large print Bible that my dad had. And I, I read from it at home. But I've carried this one for so long, it's got all the notes in it. Verse 28. Here's the plan I have for you, Moses. I've told you, you can't go over into the land. I'll take you up into the mountain. Let, let's drop back to verse 27. He just told Moses, speak no more of this matter. Matter's closed. Go up to the top of Pisgah and lift your eyes toward the west, the north, the south, and the east. Behold it with your eyes, for you shall not cross over this Jordan. But here's the plan for Moses. But command Joshua and encourage him and strengthen him. Moses, someone else is taking over. Your role is complete. It's like Paul who said, 
for the time of my departure. I'm already being offered, poured out like a drink offering. Time of my departure is at hand. I fought a good fight. Of course. Kept the faith. Henceforth, there is laid up for me a crown of righteousness. To me. Moses, you've done your work. But I've got one more task for you. I want you to go back. This man that's been your commander in the army, John. Man, him. What, what that word actually means is instruct him. Tell him where all the, the bad things are. Tell him how not to do certain things. Tell him won't work, what won't work. Encourage him to go back and, and, and start looking at the book of Joshua over and over. I forgot how many times the Lord goes to Joshua directly and says, be of strong courage. I'm with you. He's already told Moses to go back and encourage Joshua. And strengthen him. You know, so many times, and I, I think I'm right in this. You see this problem, the transition from old leadership to new leadership. And you'll see a lot of problems sometimes. See it in the business world. Think like having big problems. Pretty close to right. For every business that's transferred to the second generation, close to 70% of that of those businesses will fail. If it makes it to the third generation, more likely there'll be less than 12% because the leadership has changed. Unfortunately, you see it in churches too. Uh, I'm talking to some people right now who, who are dealing with that in church where they, they have been there all their lives. The older ones are dying off. The new ones are coming in. They change everything. And they want to go in a different direction. Not just things that are arbitrary, but things that are contrary to the scriptures. And there's no, there's no handing off the mantle of leadership. Moses, go down, encourage Joshua. Encourage the people. There's a song I, in the book, I think it's in our book, uh, I didn't look, but I meant to. Are you dwelling in the sun? Is your path with roses strewn? Have you walked with fervent gladness on the path that you have hewn? Have you reached the top of the I mean, always firm and true. Don't forget in the valley. There is someone needing you. Is it in there? You know what? What's bad, Billy, really, is if I try to quote a song, most of the time I end up having to sing it to remember what the words are. But that's what God tells Moses. Moses, you're not going over into the promised land, but your life has a purpose. And here's the purpose. There's people in the battle. That need you. They need to be strengthened. They need to be reminded of how they got here. They need to be reminded of what caused them to wander 40 days, 40 years in the wilderness. Moses, that's your purpose now. But God, I don't I don't like that answer.
My mother told me. I've told you no. Don't ask me again. God tells Moses, I've told you no. Accept no from me because I know what's best. I know the purpose I have for your life. I'm able to see out in front of you the things that you can't see. And I have a plan for you. I have a plan for your life. Moses is, Moses is 120 years old when he, when he dies. First 40 years, he spent as the son of Pharaoh. The next 40 years, he will spend as the tender of sheep with his father-in-law, Jephthah. I imagine Moses could say the same thing Paul said when he said, I know how to be abased. I know how to have it all. I know how to have it all. God has a plan for each one of us. Oh, and sometimes we want to tell him we know better than he does. Lord, I know what I need. I know what I want. Lord, I, I want to go over into the promised land. No. Not going. And don't ask me anymore. Why? Farther along, We'll know all about it. I can't see the future. I can't tell you what's going to happen when we walk out these doors. All I can tell you is Moses never asked again. Moses is a great example for us today. Sunday night, we're going to talk about one other part of the life of Moses. And it's a song that we call the verse of the life of Moses. And if not, go down Moses way down in Egypt. That's not in our book, and I don't know it all. Let's close with the word of prayer. Father, thank you for being our God. Thank you for loving us, for caring for us, for protecting us consoling us when we're sorry, when sadness comes in our life, as we'll often do. Thank you that sometimes you tell us no when we ask for certain things, because you know best what we need. You know better than we know how to ask. Father, we thank you for all the gifts that you give us, even though we are sinful and undeserving of your mercy and your grace and your manifold blessings. We ask you to forgive us when we fail you. We ask you to forgive us when we fail to do the things you've set for us to do, when we fail to listen to you. Help us to look for ways to be an aid to other people in their struggles through life. We thank you for all the blessings that we enjoy as being your children. We thank you for your love and your mercy. Above all, we thank you for your willingness to send your son to this earth. Thank you that he endured that cross and then rose again on the third day to give us a hope for a life when this life is over. May we always look to you for our strength. May we always accept your answers in our prayers. It's in your son's name we ask. Amen. See you Sunday.